Hi, welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm your host today. My name is Whitney Lee, and I'm a CNCF ambassador and a developer advocate at VMware Tanzu. So every week we bring a new presenter to showcase how to work with Cloud Native technologies. We'll build things, we'll break things, and we'll answer your questions. So this week we have Victor Gamov here with us to deliver a presentation titled Streamlined Service Mesh Observability with Kuma and Open Telemetry. Now, this that is an official- uh, uh -oh. mouthful, right? So Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I'm not even done. <laughs> oh yeah, I have some more to say. Um, I have to do this disclaimer, which is just remind everyone this is an official live stream of the CNCF. And as such, it's subject to the CNCF code of conduct. So please don't add anything to the chat that would be in violation of that code of conduct, which basically means please be respectful of each other, be respectful of Victor, be respectful to me, and we'll do the same for you. So um, friends who are joining us live, if you have any questions, please, please do drop them into the chat. We're hoping this feels more of a discussion than just a simple presentation. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Victor to kick off today's presentation. Uh, thanks so much, Whitney. Uh, yeah. uh, I wanted to say that a uh, huge fan of the things that you do, um, not only in huh. this channel, but in, in general in the internet and YouTube. I uh, love the uh, lightboarding stuff. Folks, if you haven't seen the thing that uh, Whitney does with the lightboards, to go check us out. Um, wow, and, thank uh, you. Yes, and the second thing is that I'm a long-time uh, listener, first-time caller, basically, because <laughs> we did few of those in the past, but uh, the, it was not a live thing. So we we, we kind of like uh, hand off the recording, and uh, CNCF was kind of like uh, playing, playing the, the video. But uh, it's great to have a live conversation. I was wondering uh, if uh, we can test the chat and the folks are watching us live, like write down where we're coming from, like where yeah. are you? Like uh, what's the geography of our um, of our presentation? I'm coming to you mm -hmm. from um, today is super sunny uh, New Jersey. Um, uh, we expecting to have like a very uh, you know scorching uh, scorching sun today. Um, so yeah. that's why I'm trying to avoid uh, go outside <laughs> this afternoon to, to spend time with. Uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> yeah. Let's stay in our dark rooms. I'm in Austin, Texas, so it's also nice. oh, swelteringly so you, you know. hot outside. Yeah, unbearable. Um, we have Gorov saying hello in the chat, which I love. I marvel all the time about, I'm in my 40s, so I remember when there was no internet at all. So I marvel all the time that we can be having like a real-time conversation from people across the world. I think it's just the coolest thing. I'll never get tired of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah? That's, uh, that's, how we, that's how we roll for better or for worse, and uh, let's, uh, let's get to it. So at, okay. least, uh, at least we have uh, three of us here. So we know that we have uh, me, <laughs> we have Whitney, and we have Gruff. So yes. I think it's a good, uh, good, uh, good audience to uh, start. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, as uh, the Whitney pointed out uh, earlier, uh, we're going to talk about the service mesh observability. We're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, different um, CNCF-related projects. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about Kuma, which is a CNCF incubating uh, project. Uh, I think it's a, not uh, incubating, it's a sand, still sandbox. Um, and also, obviously, Open Telemetry is also a CNCF project. Um, many um, other projects, you know, include integration. Um, this is a, a talk where um, I would like to spend a little bit of time of like slides and talking. So don't hesitate, um, interrupt and ask questions. For me, as a, I work as a developer advocate at Kong, and for me, talking to developers and make sure that I'm unblocking any like uh, things that stand in their ways to build awesome apps uh, in a cloud native way is the kind of like a, my, 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 my goals and uh, it's going to be my achievement. So Richmond, Virginia, very nice. Uh, Amitesh, welcome. Uh, Kumar says hi from LinkedIn. Great. Um, so Feel free to um, uh, to drop your questions, and Whitney, if you also see some interesting things, don't uh, hesitate to interrupt. Or maybe you know, if you want to ask some question yourself, I like to have uh, these conversations. It's much much better to do this like alone. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, and we already have a good question from chat, which is, "How is this different from Istio?" Oh, that's a very good question. That's uh, yeah? that's a very very good question. We're gonna talk about this, so uh, stick around for. Uh, um, I love the audience that go like a straight shooters and they go directly <laughs> into the business. Like, what's what's up with that? 
Um, anyways, so um, essentially uh, the observability. We're going to be talking about observability and uh, the most, most important uh, question, how the people are trying to figure out, like, hey, like, why it was so slow? Why X is slow? I put the Kuma uh, because people uh, will ask questions about Kuma um, or if I'm talking about some Kong or I can talk about some other technologies. People tend to love uh, two things, uh, why things are slow and why it's so expensive. So, so that's why kind <laughs> of like a, when you bring in conversation and give examples from, from those like categories, uh, people kind of like react um, the best, right? So uh, when you say something, oh, let me give you example with the credit card or financial uh, financial stuff, people kind of pay attention. Uh, or why things are slow. And we're going to be uh, trying to not to be uh, Charlie Day's character for all, it all his son in, in, in Philadelphia um, when he tried to investigate uh, the, the, the particular person and deliver the mail. Um, we try to investigate some of the problems that might happen in our like microservices environment and, and things like that. Um, uh, once again, my name is Victor Gamov. I work as a principal developer advocate uh, with Kong. And uh, at Kong, we build the tools for, um, we call it cloud native connectivity. That might include multiple things, but essentially APIs is in the core of any type of cloud native connectivity. So we build uh, tools that allows you as a developer um, build your API, um, APIs, uh, deploy your APIs, govern your APIs, and all those kind of things. Um, and uh, Kuma is was um, one of the projects that we started at Kong. And um, we, a couple of years back, we donated this to CNCF, and we continue to um, to develop uh, to develop this uh, service mesh in um, in open in open forum. Uh, also, we use this internally to build our own. Um, SaaS, SaaS offering for, for service mesh. Um, you can follow the Kuma mesh in the Twitter, uh, very active uh, Twitter, and we have a very active uh, Slack community as well. So brief, a brief agenda for today's, uh, for this, today's pre presentation. Um, <laughs> the, the, and the first part, I would answer what's Kuma and uh, probably how it's different from Istio. Uh, it's the, uh, one of the probably favorite questions to answer. Uh, what's the open telemetry? What's the benefits? And uh, hopefully, uh, as Whitney mentioned at the very beginning, um, we break some things. So we'll yeah. try to build things. So we'll break some things. Maybe <laughs> exactly. something will work. Um, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. It's gonna be. It's gonna be exciting. So uh, first of all, what is Kuma? <clears throat> Essentially, when we're talking about since uh, we're talking about the service meshes. Uh, people need to think about uh, two components. Essentially, it's kind of like a one big component and many smaller components. Um, essentially, service mesh includes a control plane, uh, which is a service that will be responsible for uh, storing configuration of your like microservice traffics and things like that, um, and also stored configuration about the policies that you want to enforce inside your service mesh. And uh, one of the roles of control plane is to to manage and monitor data planes. So data planes, it is a in this current iteration of the service mesh history, um, I would say it's a second generation of uh, service mesh we have. Um, control plane is the separate process that runs next to your microservice. And it basically uh, proxies all the traffic and communication happens through this proxy. It can be kind of like a reverse proxy uh, for, uh, for your services, internal and uh, external, external traffic. And control plane is responsible for configuring this and uh, sending configuration and making sure that data planes uh, have a up-to-date information about uh, the topology of, of the services. And the beauty of this, your applications, your service, this is like a uh, blue box that I have here. This service is not necessarily need to know that they run in environment like a service mesh. Comparing to past um, in uh, what we call like service mesh Generation one, when your application actually needs to include some of the libraries that implement this, like a data plane proxy uh, functionality, and uh, maybe collecting metrics and collecting all this stuff. Now, data plane is a separate process. Uh, life cycle of your application, of life cycle for your data plane, they are not they not connected. So you can upgrade your applications without updating data planes, and control plane will be responsible for. Um, for making sure that the data plane is up and running and uh, uh, has all required information to pass the traffic from one service to another. 
So back to question about what's how it's different from Istio. So Istio, it's another service mesh. Uh, or recently, like uh, almost almost a year ago, right? Uh, Istio joined uh, uh, CNCF as uh, another service mesh project, which brings number of uh, service mesh projects inside CNCF to I guess eight or 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 seven or something like that. Um, and uh, Istio popularized the the concept, but uh, obviously Istio was not the first one that um, implemented this. So uh, Kuma includes the very similar components that Istio includes. So Kuma relies on um, this another CNCF project called Envoy Proxy. So the Envoy, it is a uh, teeny tiny, super fast uh, uh, proxy server that uh, runs next to your application, this is going to be data plane, Istio uses the same thing. Um, if we're going to be, I personally not a huge fan of doing this kind of like, okay, let's do like checkbox comparison, things like that. There is a, uh, if you Google, you can find there's very uh, interesting, like a Google spreadsheet where the different service meshes compared. But three things that when we designed Kuma and when we built Kuma in, in the very beginning, we wanted to put um, uh, put uh, up front is um, developer developer productivity. We don't want it to overwhelm a developer with the like, numbers of all possible CRDs that you need to configure in order to to run this. Um, deploy deployment of control plane is literally one deployment, uh, and when we run this in Kubernetes, uh, we can enable um, sidecar injection label into namespace and control plane will be responsible for you know injecting sidecar to any application so developer productivity is, is the key here second thing was um when we plan to this we really wanted to think how the people running their workloads and in many cases in big organizations they not running those one single workload across I don't know, like one uh, AWS region or one the Google Cloud region. Uh, they're running this across multiple regions or e even maybe across the cloud. So Kuma has this concept of uh, uh, multi, multi zone, multi mesh deployment that allows to span your uh, service mesh across multiple different, um, even heterogeneous environments. I'm going to talk on the, on the next step. What does it mean in terms of Kuma? And this uh, will brings us to to kind of like a created uh, uh, unified platform for your application to run, regardless where they physically deploy. And the third step is that even though we're talking about uh, the Kubernetes, we all about all this like Kubernetes life and deploying the our pods like every every uh, minute of the day. Uh, many uh, engineers, SREs, uh, they deploy applications, not necessarily in Kubernetes. They deploy application in VMs. They deploy the application to some other um, systems of deployment. So one of the goals was to create Kuma as universal. We call it universal mesh, meaning that it's not, it doesn't have a dependency, like a, like a uh, very strict uh, dependency on Kubernetes. Um, you can deploy uh, same number of uh, data planes in Kubernetes, uh, some number of uh, data planes in, uh, in in VMs. And after that, uh, they will create this unified uh, environment across heterogeneous network. Hopefully there was a so <laughs> I, answer. I kind of have yeah. a question. I'm going to restate what yes. I... So, so three differences that set it apart from Istio. Uh, one is that it has a... It's more simple to uh, use, like a better developer experience specifically, you said. The other is yeah. um, it spans, you can span geographical regions with it pretty well. And the third is that it's not Kubernetes specific. Mm -hmm. And so um, the question I have is, is that what it sets it apart from Istio specifically, or does that also set it apart from other service meshes in the space? Yeah, very good question. So um, similarities to, to systems like Istio comes to the, the, the architecture. So they all these service meshes right now like majority service meshes, they use sidecar model. Mm -hmm. um, some of these service meshes not using, like surprise, surprise, shocking, but not all service meshes uses uh, Envoy as a, as a data planes. For example, mm -hmm. another project um, that is also CNCF project is Linkerd. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Linkerd also service mesh also provides control plane, but um, they use something different. They use they, they they chose to to develop like a purposely built the um, the, the proxy for their data planes. Um, I think what what's the um, what is not the hard, but uh, at least uh, that's the situation we see. Either uh -huh. people go in with the Istio because they were introduced in the early stage and uh, they kind of like learn how to, you know, love and hate. Sometimes people love this. Sometimes people find it challenging in a situation when they need to, you know, scale this outside Kubernetes because Istio is uh, is very well connected to uh, to Kubernetes. Uh, or you'd want to do um, things around um things around like i said with the uh the multi multi zone multi cluster deployment and all these kind of things um, um but most important thing don't listen to me uh don't listen to some other vendors you have to decide what you're comfortable when you're implementing service mesh in your environment what kind of problem it solves for you you know there would be plenty of presentations people will get you excited about this and my goal is not to tell you hey this is the best one my goal is to show you what is available and help you to decide if it is something that you want to use in your organization or maybe you want to go with these with other things that is, I don't know, historically, you know, usually it's very difficult to beat uh, historical context uh, and uh, the things that when they, someone is came in at the team and said, hey, yeah, we did use this in the past, we will continue to use it in the past. Um, mm -hmm. I'm here just to show the options. Um, that's why I said I'm not a huge fan of doing this kind of like, oh, okay, uh, let's compare the feature. This has uh, this feature and this has this feature. This has this, mm -hmm. because there's a plenty of those materials in, uh, uh, I, I, I will try to show what is possible and, uh, you know, our audience will uh, will decide. I love it. We do have a question in the chat for you from Amitesh and it's, can it be deployed and used with ECS? Yes, uh, it uh, can be deployed and used with ECS. Uh, we, yes. I, I believe we have a documentation there. Um, if you couldn't find this, um, drop me a DM on Twitter. My Twitter is conveniently placed at the bottom of my presentation. So if, in, 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 in any case, if you want to kind of like, hey, Victory, um, can you send me this link? Um, I will I will do that for you. All right. Uh, we see Sanjeev from, join us from Frankfurt. It's very well. Very great. Thank you so much Welcome. for joining. Yes. Um, and this is just basically overall architecture of any kind of like a service mesh. I, as I said, uh, Kuma is uh, um, a CNCF uh, incubating project. Uh, so, I'm sorry, Sandbox. Like we, we really want to uh, to do uh, incubating um, closer to KubeCon. So we're working uh, right now in order to kind of like make this official. But uh, we do have um, uh, some 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 very not ginormous, but I guess we have a, a very fast growing community of the users and uh, we also provide commercial support. So we know like people who, you know, build this stuff for um, uh, as, a, as a commercial thing. Um, and uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk only about Kuma. So uh, Kong Mesh that we build on top of it has some differentiator, but I'm not going to touch this today. So everything is going to be um, like as is, and you can take this and uh, run with it. Um, and uh, yes, and Envoy, uh, Envoy. So since we're talking about observability, it's it's great opportunity to talk a little bit about Envoy. So when the Envoy was created, one of the goals that uh, the Matt um, at Klein and his team at um, um, at Lyft they come up with this um, an early stage that services that this Envoy would be fronted as a proxy. They needs to be um, dynamically configurable. So we don't have to send the person to go and configure our proxy server. This needs to be API to 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 configure this. And observable all the way. So they want to uh, they want to see first of all, every time when you're introducing some additional hop in your network, you want to make sure that you're not introducing unnecessary latency here, right? So they want to make sure that the things that we're introducing with this proxy will not introduce additional problems. So they need to have observability along the way, uh, all the things that uh, Envoy provides. And these two things help uh, people to build some of the other things on top of the Envoy. So um, so what, what, the, uh, what the control plane is actually does 
it takes the definition of whatever network policy and translate this into configuration that will be shipped into Envoy. Um, including the things we've, uh, we're gonna. Sh I will. I will show some of the examples of how we can uh, manage traffic between the services in order to um, introduce some of the failures. And I will talk about this when we will introduce those. Why you want to introduce failures? Um, and uh, and yeah. And uh, another thing is to 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 observe services and collect the metrics from the from the older nodes. Which brings us to uh, to Open Telemetry. Open Telemetry it is a uh, standard. Uh, first of all, it's a standard that come up over years of uh, different industry leaders um, talking about uh, different uh, pillars of uh, observability. We know this is um, uh, metrics, uh, traces, and logs. Uh, those are considered the pillars of observability. So metrics will give you information what is happening right now. Um, logs will um, give you information what has happened. And traces basically give you uh, kind of like this trace, this, <laughs> what happened across the system. Because we're going to be interacting between multiple micro microservices. And you want to know that what happened in the system X when failure happened on the system Y. So that's kind of um, the open telemetry as a as an open source project includes specifications, including set of tools uh, to collect data, set of libraries that you can um, embed in your applications and in instrument uh, your applications and um, send uh, telemetry data into whatever system that able to consume it. So. That's the um, that's the that's the that's the premise. Um, there's a different um, um, groups, I would say. Some some uh, group of developers they prefer to have a control over the things, so they prefer to um, embed this open telemetry libraries in their application. So in this case, they instrument their application by enabling these libraries. Another group of people, they want to keep their microservices teeny tiny and they don't want to include additional tools or additional um, libraries in their microservices and also manage those things and make sure that the libraries have a capabilities across different languages and things like that. So those people want to have a infrastructure that will mm -hmm. be able to collect all the data. So. Essentially, we're going to talk for the rest of this presentation, we're going to talk about the second part of this. So I'm not going to go ahead and instrument my, my applications in order to support open telemetry. I'll show you how we can enable declaratively when the application runs inside Service Mesh, um, how we can start getting these benefits of uh, collecting, um, collecting the open telemetry data. Um, so... Like we can we can get the different uh, different benefits for business for 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 developers. Um, uh, we have uh, some of the features that built in in uh, in uh, in the gateway, but I want to focus on um, actual what the mesh does with this open telemetry and how this will work um, with uh, with our content. So there's a couple 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 components that open telemetry defines. So the first one is a. Um, open telemetry collector. So this thing that uh, I have here in the center of my screen. So open telemetry collector, this is the small intermediate tool that we're going to be using. Uh, you can definitely use uh, some of those um, open telemetry backends without it. Um, but um, this open telemetry collector does a few interesting things that you definitely want to check it out. So first of all, um, it has the ability to batch things. So you'd want to, um, with a number of metrics and traces and logs that your system has, overwhelm your backend. So Open Telemetry Collector can perform some batching so we can optimize how the metrics would be delivered without sacrificing the, you know, the uh, delays for receiving the metrics, for example. Um, also, the we can have, not every system might have native support for open telemetry. So that's why there's another component called receiver. 
that can collect this uh, data, this telemetry data from different systems, including native open telemetry format, or maybe Jaeger format, or Zipkin format, or in format of Prometheus. And uh, open telemetry collector will take this into something that uh, will backend understand. So maybe even do some of the processing and transformation along the way. So we have a we have a receiver that gets the data from the system of um, our system um, that has a processor that does some internal massaging of the data. Um, and we have exporter that will have connection to um, our external system. In order to, uh, in order to collect this uh, data inside service mesh, we will need to define a policy that will be um, collecting some of the information that going between different uh, different components and uh, send this into open telemetry collector. So is it time where I'm switching from my presentations and going into my uh, where should we start? We should start with the uh, quick uh, observation of this application. So right now this application is deployed uh, into my Kubernetes cluster that runs uh, somewhere in GCP. And uh, this is my, like, the public IP address. You can go and hit this uh, IP address uh, from, from, from anywhere in the world. Um, and in this case, if you go to this IP address slash work, it's a simulator of my life. So when I go to work, I do I do meetings. I go to meetings. <laughs> so that's why when I click here, go to work, I went for four meetings. And it took me one, uh, one millisecond. So inside this, let me quickly show this. Hopefully, my, my boss will not going to see this. But uh, we're here friends. We're not going to report <laughs> So if I'm go to my uh, meeting application, uh, what I do in the meetings? Well, I spend uh, my time very productively. So, <laughs> so I sleep for half a uh, uh, for quarter of the second, and so that's why when my work is happening, like four meetings equals one second. So two microservices, um, and let me open this uh, fairly straightforward, uh, fairly straightforward uh, deployments. Um, it has a deployment uh, that uh, includes this this application, and it has a service. So this this within uh, within Kubernetes cluster it will be available uh, through uh, meeting dot mesh for devs um, dev space. Work application includes a few things here. So it's also deployment, but also it needs to receive the uh, meeting URL from uh, from somewhere because. Uh, one of the components, one of the important step when you're running this in microservice world is service discovery. So somehow the services need to be discovered and the configuration needs to be provided to, um, to, to application to receive this URL. So in this particular case, I'm using this uh, Kubernetes default, even though um, there is a ways how we can customize it. And specifically for when we need to deploy this in the multi-zone, multi-mesh environment, uh, we really don't want to rely on like a namespaces or some some of the other uh, places where it can identify our service uh, in a not very consistent way. So, for example, um, the service mesh also provides DNS service, um, and uh, DNS service uh, with dot mesh you can customize it, and uh, inside everywhere inside this mesh, this meeting application will be accessible through this uh, mesh uh, DNS name um, or through the port directly. Um, I'm not going to spend much of the time because it's uh, like slightly beyond the, the, the actual topic for, for today's conversation, even though it's also related to uh, traffic policies inside service mesh. So, and also uh, Kuma itself uh, includes a gateway component that allows me to expose the service to a toad site world. So the way how it looks like, um, is actually um, uh, exposes my work service through this uh, this prefix, um, and uh, inside the Kuma, we use Envoy as a gateway. So we provision another data plane that would be special type of this data plane um, that will behave as a gateway for for our application. So that's why I said 
every time if you want to hit this URL right now from the well from from your computer, like what what could go wrong? Um, so you can do something like I don't know, just do curl. Uh, uh, yes, I can do something like this, and this should work as well. Yeah, so uh, works everywhere in the world. Um, let's take a look at how this uh, service mesh thing is looks like. So Kuma also comes with the um, uh, with very very nice UI. So it comes with this uh, UI uh, control plane mm, uh, exposes this UI, so I can get in to see what is going on in my in my mesh. There's a bunch. If you have a uh, multiple different meshes deployed here, you will see those here. But we're interested in default for now. And uh, here we can investigate some of the data plane proxies that deployed next to our uh, next to our applications. So I can see there's a few services. One service is for my work application, one service for my meeting application. And this is the special type of service that was created by Kuma. That will be gateway for, for our application. And uh, also inside my cluster, I'm running Prometheus as Grafana, like just uh, to see what is going on there. They also joined the mesh and the mesh also can uh, collect some of the traffic here. Um, now, so now how we can configure those uh, th those tracing information. So the services are registered. So we see the services are, are communicating now. Um, I need to find a way how I can collect the, the data between those systems. So in, um, in the mesh, we have this concept of the policies. And one of the policies that would be responsible for collecting traces is called mesh trace. So mesh trace, uh, as you can see here, it is a uh, shows shows a specification of this uh, of the mesh trace. Let me show this in a bigger font in a, in another screen. So um, some of the very uh, people who watch this with very much attention, I'm just lost the word how I can say this. The person who can see this with attention. Anyway, so if you would look carefully to this presentation, you can notice this is the YAML here is not exactly like YAML here. So that's the that's the part of this universal mode. Um, kind of, uh, this is the YAML how this mesh can be configured if you're running this website Kubernetes. But inside Kubernetes, it looks uh, how Kubernetes uh, how pe Kubernetes people expecting this thing to see to to um, to see. In this particular case, we have API version, we have a kind, so it's going to be CRD um, inside. If I go just do um, uh, group control, get, uh, mesh, and uh, there's a bunch of different uh, CRDs is already deployed. There's uh, uh, mesh fault injections, gateway instances, mesh insights, proxy patch. There's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, cool things that can be, uh, can be configured here. Um, and inside this this policy, what we wanted to have is we wanted to have um, all the traffic will be collected through the backend. So we need to route all this trace trace information somewhere. Inside my Kubernetes cluster, I already have a couple things um, that are running here. Uh, specifically, if I'm running here, there's a, my open telemetry collector that will be available within my Kubernetes cluster through this my open telemetry collector dot default SVC cluster local. So all the metrics will go there. And I can put some additional uh, some additional information for Kuma to to collect. So I want to include um, environment header. I want to include um, the version information. So when I will be deploying these applications, and uh, redeploying the application, I will be able to trace down and see what is going on here. Now, with the uh, with this trace, uh, where is it? I'm sorry. Yeah. So with the open telemetry collector, I need to also con uh, configure this collector somehow. So the way how it works um, in the Helm chart that this open telemetry collector provides me. Um, you can actually get the, there's a lot of things configured. You can configure multiple different uh, environments, uh, um, different integrations and all this kind of thing. So this is uh, the, the, the collector is very 
sophisticated and has a lot of things. The collector, this, the things in the center that I'm talking right now. It's an open telemetry collector. Inside this open telemetry collector, I stripped down this to something that can be easily digested for, for my use. We go with, um, with pipelines that will define how the data will flow. So pipelines include traces and includes logs. We receive this from uh, OTLP, which is Open Telemetry um, uh, Receiver. We do some processing. In this particular case, we're going to be batch this with the default configuration. And we export those traces. Same thing for the logs. So inside here, inside this YAML, uh, I'm going and seeing this receiver uh, that configures this uh, Open Telemetry Collector. So this Open Telemetry Collector uh, will be available through this port. Uh, this is processor, nothing fancy, but the magic actually happens here. So the exporter, that's the backend that will be, you know, collect all the data. Um, backend can be here, something like Jaeger can be backend, can be something like a data dog, something like Honeycomb. I just use Honeycomb because I found the their integration is like easiest to do. For me, I just need to put the endpoint in the API key. Uh, don't worry, this API key will disappear uh, right after the stream. Just the uh, <laughs> reason I'm sh showing this is just to, to see like everything is uh, uh, is very explicit. Now, and after that, um, once this data will be produced by my services, I will call one service. This data will, uh, will gateway will call work service, work service will call our meeting service. And all the trace information will be propagated to Open Telemetry Collector. In Open Telemetry Collector, we'll push it into Honeycomb. So let's see how this will work. So for that, I will be using very sophisticated uh, the benchmark tool to generate some traffic. Uh, it's called uh, send a request uh, on interval. So the insomnia in this case will be sending this request every second. So and we will start getting some of the interesting data here. Uh, obviously, Open Telemetry Collector has um, the default um, log collector. It's kind of like a backend that doesn't go anywhere. And all the headers, all this information that come in from the systems will be spit out here in a log. So you can also see if this is actually working. But uh, we visual people will like to see if it actually works with the, with the system. So uh, for the last 10 minutes, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm start getting some of, the, some of the traffic. Some of the data comes in and I can see the traces coming in here. Uh, it can show me different things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I would love to see actual spans. In this particular case, there's a one that happens one second ago. Let's explore it, what kind of information we will be able to see here. So now we see the data comes into, uh, into router that as our uh, gateway. After that, uh, our uh, request goes into um, into service that will be this our data plane proxy you have a question Whitney can you make it bigger oh of course thank you yeah, yeah. sure um, I'm, I'm not sure if the UI will not fall apart yeah that should be something like this um, and uh, as we can see uh, let actually just is it is it still okay yeah okay so I wanted to show the this kind of like a spans because a uh, few things that we can see because um, uh, we call this work service once and we get the response uh, for, I don't know why it's two seconds. It's supposed to be one second total. Um, maybe something, uh, maybe some, 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 maybe some, some extra information that I need to investigate. But the, uh, my meeting service was called one, two, three, four, and we have precisely around, you know, including the some of the um, network things that happened, um, uh, 250 milliseconds of sleep. So we do have some um, some information here. How this can be? How this information can be useful? Well, some of the information can be useful uh, for situations like um, investigating some problems. How we can get uh, into problems? Uh, in the world of service mesh, service mesh can help you solve the problems, but also can introduce some of the problems. Um, and this is actually a very, very cool thing that service mesh can do. 
uh, there's a concept called a fault injection that comes from, I guess it comes from this uh, chaos engineering methodology, right? You kind of like mm -hmm. uh, injecting failures on purpose inside your system. So you see how your system will behave. Um, when we, when we, uh, when I talk to my SREs uh, that uh, who support the um, Connect Cloud, they have this concept of game day. So what does it mean? They, one of these, uh, uh, one of the practices that they like to do is to um, have a scenario of a failure and inject declaratively this failure into the system, and. As a as an architect of the system or like a, a SRE of the system, they have some idea what could happen because people know about systems or some people might not know what could happen because they just join the team. They don't have a full context of what happens. So there's a scenario how the system will behave, including maybe a system will go to failure. It will um, start uh, send alerts and all these kind of things. All this fun stuff that you're expecting uh, at night when you sleep in and something goes wrong with your life system. In order to sleep a little bit better, people like to be prepared. So that's why we're doing these game days. So we inject these failures into system and see if our um, alerts came out, if our um, dashboards detected this and we see the spikes and the all responsible parties were notified. It's kind of like a simulation of actual thing that ha might happen in a real life. Like a fire alarm. I exactly, yes, you file drill like rather. Fire drill, yes. fire drill, exactly. yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so let's, let's try to simulate this. And specifically here, I want to um, inject some of the failures between my two services. So remember, uh, my work service calling my meeting service four times. So if I'm injecting this 50% uh, uh, of failure, so it will supposed to be calling this like two times, right? Also, I really want to see if my uh, telemetry system will be able to report those problems. Um, at least at least we will be able to absorb because I'm not going into kind of uh, an alerting mechanism because it would be also different from the system or whatever you use, but at least you have a data so you will be able to do this. So. I'm go ahead and um, and just do apply mesh fault injection. So fault injection is created. So now immediately we start seeing like one meeting, two meetings. We start seeing some of the some of the stuff is going on. So um, between those two services, now there is a fault injection thing working. Let's take a look if we will be able. If yep, go ahead. For those people watching live, if you want to play around and see that you're getting fewer meetings, do it on your own. You can follow that. Yeah, yeah. That would, I'll leave this on the screen. I suppose that would yeah. be even um, even cooler because uh, we will get um, uh, real uh, real traffic to uh, to generate, right? I'm playing with it over here. Yeah. 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 So uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, we reported some of the traces, and some of the traces we can go and just query. Uh, we can do show what are my errors. And it can show some of the supposed to be showing me where is it? Um, there should be something like all data sets and text. And what are my errors? We will be able to see our 500 two hours prior one. Uh, so we do have a few errors. True. So um, 200. The response is not considered as a, as error, but um, 500 is considered as error. So we have uh, some of the errors here. So let's investigate. So let's uh, let's open one of the spans that we uh, we, we might see here. Uh, two minutes ago, do we have anything uh, more more recent? A few seconds ago. So we see that uh, uh, we receive uh, some information from service uh, with the error. We're getting this information in the format of um, uh, access log. Um, in my in my configuration here, I also collecting not only traces but also like access logs. And uh, inside my mesh, I have a policy configured that also pushes data into Open Telemetry Collector from the policy that called mesh access log. 
So that's another thing that you can use in, in your tool belt. Now let's go back into, um, let's see if I will be able to see some of the recent traces that will include the error. So let's take a look. Now, immediately what we can see here. So first of all, um, it's not, it's not precise science. Like when I said it's going to be 50%, um, it's actually sampling and also there's a sliding window. So we as people uh, like to observe things in a deterministic world, but computers in the real life is not happening in the deterministic world. So in our sliding window that we're trying to observe in this particular case, it was just like one, uh, one of these um, requests failed. But if I open another span, we can find in our, if we want to be like very picky about kind of like what we're talking about. But essentially what I'm trying to show you here that um, the in the real life, if you have a real life 500 response, you probably will have a different, um, different lens. You will be able to get the trace where the thing had happened. And after that, you can use the tools like Loki that captures all the logs and the correlate this trace ID with particular call in uh, in the log, uh, for example. Uh, for that matter, I do have um, I do have uh, uh, Grafana is running, and inside Grafana, inside my Kubernetes cluster, I have a Loki. Uh, let me go into explore tra search from from Mesh Gateway, and from the last five minutes, run query. We make it bigger, please. Oh yes, of course. Thank you. Um, no errors. I don't see why. I don't see this. Uh, there should be some more traces, say 30 minutes. No. Um, let's see if I have a traces from, from yesterday, because I'm pretty sure I have some traces that I was testing this yesterday. Um, and inside this, there's no errors. There's, there's some, some traces without errors. Let's see. Uh, and uh, HTTP status quote. And if I go, yeah. So for example, here I will be able to navigate into particular like place in the log, supposedly. Why, Victor, you're not navigating to the right place. So inside the log, I will be able to see what has happened here, what kind of error happened, like there is a Java net util, whatever error happened. So from the trace, uh, there's a good correlation between logs. So you know like where exactly error happened. Uh, so like in this particular case, uh, we see the only, only trace and uh, we um, will be able to see. And another thing is that um, since we're running this inside the service mesh, the response time is um, very, very quick. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that uh, basically the, uh, the data plane proxy, short, short circuit, all these kind of things, because this failure was injected um, um, as a I don't know, synthetic error. Mm -hmm. um, this thing is actually, um, you know, short, short circuit. In, in the real life, your, you know, if it was a real request, um, you will be able to see maybe there's a there was a slightly more time usually you know when the system might depend on database or some <clears throat> some other system uh, we can see the situation with cascading failures and uh, usually usually the way how you can de de um, uh, the way how you can detect the cascading failures you see the latency is growing because one system trying to reach another system and uh, there would be either retries or something like that so by default, when you run this inside uh, the Kuma mesh, Kuma actually applies some of the... Uh, remember when I was talking about the developer experience, we also wanted to apply some of the sane, uh, sane policies. Uh, for example, there's a circuit breaker policy that um, automatically for every service inside the mesh um, will introduce max number retries. So even because we're running this in Kubernetes, we're running this in a, in a, in a, in a, it's, it's not the dedicated environment because probably my cluster is uses like a cheapest possible tier on Google cloud. So it uses shared infrastructure. So some of the failures can happen just because, you know, I'm running this in a somewhere else computer. So in order to not introduce, uh, 
false positives. Uh, we also, whenever we're running this inside service mesh, by default enable these policies. Uh, we have a maximum retries, a number of requests, and all these kind of things. Uh, that's called like a circuit breaker, uh, circuit breaker policy that runs inside. There is also um, a retry policy that is uh, um, we configured based on some like uh, empirical and uh, based on the recommendations from community. So it's kind of like a good enough. But mm -hmm. as a as a SRE as operator, you will be able to go and check these things without changing the code of the application. That's whole kind of like a whole purpose of this. Now, so I have a couple yeah. of questions. One Please. is if there's time also, do you have of enough course. presentation? Okay. One is about, um, you showed briefly that you can use the service mesh to expose your service to outside of the cluster. Correct. Does that mean you would use this? Um, you could possibly use this as your ingress implementation. Like you might not, you might not have a separate ingress. You could just use uh, Kuma all the way. Yes. Or would you Correct. want both? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Um, so the the thing what we like to say here at Kong, so the Kong um, known as a as a one of the most popular one of the most popular API gateways, uh -huh. and people usually expect every time when they talk about all the things like I will bring the Kong. So yes, it will work definitely with a Kong as an external API gateway. Potentially, it also will work with um, any ingress controller. Um, so the, the way how it works, it will service mesh will also inject the data plane proxy into this like ingress controller. So mm -hmm. potentially it will also be able to work with any uh, ingress controller. Um, many users and customers they're asking like, oh, okay, I don't want to overcomplicate my infrastructure. So in this case, I just want to have a, like a bare minimum on this. I don't want to like have a full blown API management on my system. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay. We have already an Envoy, and what about we will just like use Envoy as our ingress? So this is exactly what the Mesh Gateway does. And if you think about this, last year, um, I think last year was uh, KubeCon when the Envoy team announced that they're going to be building um, a gateway uh, based on Envoy uh, and based on the Gateway API which is another uh, very exciting mm -hmm. um, piece of uh, specification that coming hopefully this uh, this winter will come into kind of like a GA or at least like land as a as a as a good to test type of thing inside the kubernetes so we um, as a as a community we work um, closely with the CNCF um, and Kube, uh, Kubernetes um, special interest group, like a few engineers from uh, from Kong actually help to 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 define Gateway API and Gamma, which Thanks. is Gamma is a gateway for uh, for for meshes, so specifications mm -hmm. for for this. So it's all it's all shaping up. It's uh, sh shaping up very well uh, and very good with the help of community and help of the with the people who are interested in the, in this type of jazz. So. Yes, you don't have to use if you don't want to. Um, yeah. It has a, all the batteries included. Things with the yeah. If I go to gateway, so it has a built-in. Uh -huh. There is another type. That if I will run this with Quark, it would be a thing called uh, delegated. So uh -huh. the, the 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 and there's also like all this like bells and whistles that comes with the another API gateway. I have. Okay, and and so my second question is just a complete departure from this particular thing. Uh, no, you no, talked, no, absolutely, yes. You talked about um, uh, ways to collect data from your running service or your running application, and you can do it uh, with OpenTelemetry by importing a library where it's tightly coupled with your application itself, or you can do it uh, using a service mesh like Kuma, and, and that's exactly what you demoed. And my question is, um, is the information that you get at the end the same regardless of the implementation, or do you get different sets of different types of logs or different information uh, depending on which way you do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a very good question. So the answer is that OpenTelemetry uh, defines a standard of the formats, how this uh, data will be formatted. And mm -hmm. regardless, if you're using the instrumentation inside your application, uh, mm -hmm. or if you're using the uh, the instrumentation that built in into things like service mesh or API gateway, uh, you will still end up with the same data format. So, like, if um, so, I will use uh, example from from Honeycomb. Let me open one of the 
one of the things. There should be something like a, a raw. Um, let me run some query just to. It should be kind of like a raw data, and the raw data allows me to see how this this stuff would look. Nope, where is it? Uh, so yeah, the raw data, uh, this all this information that is included, mm -hmm. and all these messages. You see this the, the 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 tags that I propagated from my policy. Say, I can include some additional information here declaratively when I do mesh trace. So mm -hmm. I said, okay, so I will include the some some you know, some stuff. Um, there is a, uh, should be something like a service name. There should be something like some additional information like environment or something like that. Um, user agent data was extracted from the headers. Um, so you will be able to see uh, same information regardless. It's the, the, the format of the payload um, that standard defines. Okay. So short answer is uh, it's the same. It's, uh, yeah, it's the same. It's like choose your own poison. Like if you want okay. to maintain libraries or you want to maintain infrastructure. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, with the uh, you didn't ask me, but I still answer. <laughs> um, the as you can see in this, like if using like open telemetry collector, you have a flexibility on. Uh, what can be done by infrastructure rather than mm -hmm. your application. Say you have an application that, Spring Boot application that uses Micrometer to report all the metrics mm -hmm. in a format of Prometheus. Mm -hmm. You still can use Open Telemetry Collector and send the data in the format of the, um, the Open Telemetry. So the, the beauty of this uh, tool that it can receive data from multiple different uh, sources uh, whereas if you're using this as a library, so you use Spring Boot with Micrometer, so hopefully there's an easy way to migrate one format to another. Uh, sometimes some of the fields are not available. Sometimes are other fields like available in one format and not available in another format. So it will require some of the you know application code change. In another uh, um, things to consider, when you're using libraries, different languages might have its support for different, uh, you know, some of the languages has like a full support of every possible step of specification. Some of the mm -hmm. SDKs and libraries might not. So it uh, it really, uh, it really depends. Like this is the, <laughs> this is the consultant talking to me inside me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <it depends>. But <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's both available. They're going to be the same data. The, the way how it's end up into your uh, backend system is going to be the same. Excellent. Um, we have about two minutes left. I have. A, do you have anything you want to say in closing? Uh, the last one is we always do in the internets and the YouTube uh, yes. uh, this stuff. Like, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, you know the the, the things. Uh, uh, I don't. I you probably also f you know the felt it as a kind of like a developer relations spe specialist for the last couple of years. We had to change the way how we approach our uh, our audience. And uh -huh. we spend more time on YouTube. We spend more time on kind of like a building setups. Like I also build a light board uh, uh, in my basement. So I also doing the, the this type of uh, explainers. Oh, nice. So a lot of uh, a lot of things um, um, like three years ago, I said, I'm not going to do any TikToks. Now I'm doing like short videos explaining like a smaller bits <laughs> 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 about API management. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested in uh, API management, Kubernetes, cloud native technologies, uh, service mesh, um, I, I post a lot of content on the Kong YouTube channel and I'm happy to, you know, answer any questions regardless of, um, of the topic. I, I know a few, a few things. <laughs> <laughs> At least five things. We also have some yeah. lovely comments from the guests. It's been an excellent presentation of the technology. And as a final question, they said, can we, let's do it again. Let's of do course, it again. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so um, much, Juan. That's if nice. If you, if you, uh, if you didn't know, um, all these things are recorded and uh, available in uh, CNCF uh, YouTube channel. You also yep. need to go and subscribe to this one. 
Uh, it's massive. Mm -hmm. Like if you missed for some reasons KubeCon, uh, the videos will be available within a weeks from from uh, from the KubeCon. So subscribe yeah. to CNCF uh, channel, enable notification, and uh, we'll see yeah. you <laughs> at the next one. Stay abreast of all the news. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the ending script. Are we ready for the? Yeah. Goodbye, everyone. Um, thank you so much for jo joining today's episode of Cloud Native Live. I don't think we broke anything. What the heck, Victor? <laughs> no, uh, we didn't. We, so, no, we didn't live up to our promises. <laughs> no, there were a few things that uh, 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 they were broken, but I didn't show this. It's kind of you know. Remember this meme from the office when the you know when the in the when the presentation went well and the the customer didn't notice and the Dwight Schrute is kind of like a smirky looking at the camera. The moment, that was the moment that I, um, there, yeah. There's the moment the traces the were full information were... wasn't showing up and you pulled it from yesterday. Yeah, okay, there was one. You're just exactly, you're just yes. like a magician with a sleight of hand. <laughs> yes. We have a, another nice comment from chat too. Love it. It's great. Thank you, Diego. All right. Um, oh, accidentally. There we go. All right. Um, so thank you so much, Victor Gamoff, for teaching us about service mesh observability with uh, Kuba and open telemetry. Um, the audience, y'all are great, super fun in chat and from all over the world, which I will never stop loving. And um, here at Cloud Native Live, we bring you the latest in Cloud Native code every Wednesday at noon U.S. Eastern. And we're actually adding Tuesday episodes, too. So the next oh, episode wow. is going to be next Tuesday. Yeah. So um, thanks for joining us today. And thanks to everyone who watches the recording. And thank you, Victor. And everyone have a wonderful, wonderful day.